From 1987 through 1996, the leading cause of air carrier hull loss was loss of control. It should be very beneficial to place more emphasis on aircraft maneuvering characteristics and unusual attitude recoveries in both transition and recurrent training. Hello, I'm Captain Warren Vandenberg, and I would like to introduce you to the first in a series of video segments from the Advanced Aircraft Maneuvering Program. In this video, we'll review unusual attitude recovery procedures. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the body of knowledge that we have developed to this point, and we're going to apply it to uh, procedures that we've developed at American Airlines to deal with unusual attitude or critical flight attitude recoveries. We have developed a procedure for nose low recoveries and a procedure for nose high recoveries. And we have found using those two procedures, you can deal with a myriad of bad things that can happen out, the, out there to you, as you'll see later today. But before we can get into those procedures, first we have to develop something we call situation awareness. All pilots understand that. What we have to first know is what is it we are in so we know which procedure to apply to get out of it. And uh, as we start to look at this issue, it became kind of interesting. As I worked through various fleets, uh, uh, watching again our mostly Czech airmen performing, you know, in those uh, various fleet issues, each of those critical flight attitude recovery software problems I was putting in there, I noticed something that a large percentage of our pilots had is kind of an airline pilot uh, uh, mentality, if you will. I would give them a perfectly clear day out there. You could see the whole planet in the simulator. A and then I would upset them with some of this new software, and I noticed that they would immediately go right to the attitude indicator and work this problem as they sorted it on the attitude and I'd get that thing recovered, and they'd recover, and I'd go, hey, that was really great. Nice job. But did you ever think of looking outside? See? What I'm trying to suggest to you here is, if you have a visible horizon, i.e. you can see the planet, use it. It is your best piece of essay you could ever have. Now, if you can't see the horizon, you know, it's hazy and you're in a fishbowl or something, you can only see straight down to the ground, or maybe you're pure IMC, now you're going to have to come to this. Now the next thing I learned is I flew all the different fleet simulators that I had never really thought about before I started developing this program is that these flat plate displays have got significant limitations in this arena. I had not thought much about that. See, in my other life I did all of this on a ball attitude indicator. And the ball attitude indicator told me a lot about what was going on. But on a flat plate display, all you get is a little piece of the picture. And, and so we had to develop a means of getting situation awareness that would work across all of the fleets in American Airlines, because I think everyone in this room clearly understands that as you go from fleet to fleet to fleet, you don't want to have a different way of doing something that's a critical procedure every time. We want to train you every time you come down here to do this the same way, both get your SA and do the procedure. should work on all fleet aircraft. And we have accomplished that, I believe. Now, you'll have to come with me on this, because initially you may balk just slightly. Okay? So come along with me for a minute, because you will see why we chose it to do it this way. What we're going to say is you have a three-step process to get your SA, and this applies on 7-2 Asaurus or our most modern, highly automated airplanes. The three steps are, first, you must locate the sky pointer. The sky pointer is this little white diamond with a hollow center. There's one of those on every American Airlines fleet aircraft, and you have to find it first. You'll see why in a minute. Second, we're going to say you need to determine your pitch attitude slant deck angle, i.e., relative to the fixed aircraft symbol, am I nose high or nose low? That'll determine the recovery procedure to be applied. And then lastly, you have to locate your horizon line. Well, that becomes another one of these flat plate display limitations. As you can see in this example, the horizon line is gone from view. So therefore, there has to be a 3A which says, if there is no horizon, I will use my pitch ladder bar as the horizon reference because it is always parallel to. 
So one, two, three. Locate the sky pointer. Am I nose high or nose low relative to the fixed aircraft symbol? Where's my horizon line? If there isn't a horizon line, I will use the pitch ladder bar as my horizon reference. Now this yellow down here, confirm your attitude by reference to other indicators. What that's referring to is all the experienced pilots in this room, I'm sure, can imagine. If you're in your, your approach plates, you know, or something like that, and you look up and you see your attitude indicator in a really strange position, before you do something wild and crazy with the flight controls, be sure it's not just your attitude indicator. See? And, and I know you understand it. Now, that becomes fleet specific. In each fleet, there's a different other thing that you check for confirmation, and rightfully so. So you check here, and we'll brief you on those. OK. Now let's go first and develop situation awareness. I will do recovery procedures in a minute. Right now, let's just develop SA. Let's look at the guy that's on this attitude indicator. What does he look like? Well, he's climbing. Not too tough. He can handle this. We're going to do another one now. I would ask you, if you wouldn't mind, announce out loud when I push this one up, what's the first thing we have to find? OK? Ready? Go. Yes, the sky pointer. And it is in what I call the zone. <laughs> it's in the oh, shoot zone. Guys and gals, the accident history in the airline business on this is horrible. Airline pilots finding themselves in this attitude have demonstrated a consistent penchant to put 1G on their airline butt. And if you put 1G on your butt right now, it will add to God's existing 1G. That becomes 2Gs. And this airplane is in a tight turn, and it's taking you somewhere you don't want to go. We must immediately recognize that our lift vector is pointed at the dirt. We'll talk about how to deal with that in a minute. Okay? We identify the fact that our lift vector is pointed at the dirt. In a minute, we will soon learn to associate our lift vector with our sky pointer. Okay, second thing we have to find. What is my pitch attitude relative to the fixed aircraft symbol? Nose high or nose low? Nose low. And lastly, where's my horizon line? Right there. I got everything I need to know. We'll do recoveries in a minute. Right now, just SA. What does this aircraft look like? Looks like that. You're about to be challenged to recover from a critical flight attitude. Let's do another one together. If you don't mind, out loud, when I flash it up, we'll go through the first three steps. What's the first thing we got to find? Yeah, now that's not so bad, is it? I can live with that. OK, next thing. Rel yeah. Relative to the fixed aircraft symbol, I'm very nose high, aren't I? And then lastly, where's my horizon? It's gone, isn't it? So what am I going to use? Yep, I'll have to use the pitch ladder bar as my horizon reference for the recovery. Because it's always parallel to. All right, let's take a look at this guy. Now, folks on the left side here are probably getting excited. <laughs> on the other hand, the folks on the right are still reading their newspaper, aren't they? No clue. OK, let's do one more. And if you don't mind, once again, out loud together, what's the first thing we've got to find here? Oh, shoot. Next thing. Yeah, very low, isn't it? Very low relative to the fixed aircraft symbol. And then lastly, my horizon line. i got everything I need to know to recover now. We'll do recoveries in a second. What's he look like? This fellow is in deep kimchi if he's close to the ground because his nose is so low, right? He can get out of this, but he's got to get very aggressive with the flight controls, as we'll talk about in a minute. 
Okay. Now, having developed our situation awareness, we need to apply some procedures to that. As you know, these procedures are now in every American Airlines fleet manual. Our intention here today, though, is to, is to go through these procedures you have in your manual as pilot to pilot and, and, and talk about what does each of these bullets mean and how do we apply them. Before I start on these procedures that are in all of your manuals, there's something we need to get clear in this room between all of us. And that is that the first step on every procedure and in everything that we do today is not written on any slide. The reason I don't put it on all the slides is because it is always the same first step. Always. The first unseen, unwritten step says that when your airplane is departing its intended lateral or vertical path, the pilot flying will go click, 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 click. Autopilot and auto throttles off is always the first step. And I cannot overemphasize this point. As we look at the accident history out there, we see automation dependent pilots with an airplane departing its intended lateral vertical path, pushing buttons up here on an AFDS panel or typing in typewriters down here, not realizing that this plane has got a serious anomaly. And the, before they realize it, the airplane gets very close to the edge of their flight envelope while they're typing. Don't let that happen. Get a hold of it. When it's departing this intended lateral or vertical path, turn that stuff off. Find out what's going on here. Don't let it get that close to the edge of the envelope. Not to mention, you should see how interesting it is trying to recover from one of these with the autopilot on. Okay? Or even worse, the auto throttles. You should see what they can do to you. Okay? Okay, that's always the first step. Now, having completed the first step, then we're going to look at each of the bullets for the nose high recovery process. Before I do that, though, I have to identify this one, which is thrust, because it's in the number three position, and I've already had so many pilots ask this that I have to just cover it right up front. I know many pilots uh, were trained, and, and probably rightfully so at the time, that on a nose-high recovery, thrust comes first. In fact, the FAA Instrument Flying Handbook says, thrust comes first when your nose high. Well, now, how can I go against the FAA? See? Well, they're not wrong, but see, they wrote their book for a Cessna 172, which has a fan on the nose and a total inertial range of 40 knots. We have thrust vector effect and an inertial range of 400 knots. That does not work for us. I mean, as an example, if you had a plane built like this, and you found that airplane in this attitude, and the first thing you did was cob the power, what would happen? Sure, wow. Well, now which way is the nearest horizon? <laughs> Good news is you can't be wrong. <laughs> that doesn't work for us, okay? Not on our kind of airplane. So we're going to belay that, and we're, the first step is going to deal is going to deal with the issue. The issue being, let's get the nose stop rising and start lowering. It says we will unload and roll the airplane toward the nearest horizon to lower the nose while maintaining some positive g-force. Well, what does that mean? Well, first, unload. I think uh, most of the pilots in this room understand we got an airplane like this, right? There's this flight path vector, i.e., angle of attack. If we unload, what we're saying, as you know, is to ease the yoke forward. Unload your butt off the seat. In other words, move toward zero G. Maybe not go all the way. You might have people walking around back there. But move pretty close to zero. If we come off of one and move toward zero by pushing the yoke forward, what happens to this angle? It goes right in like that, doesn't it? When it goes right in like that, if you have no more alpha, you have no more lift. If you have no more lift, the nose stops rising. That's good. See? 
The other good thing is when you reduce alpha down to almost zero, you enable all control surfaces to work normally down to almost no speed. That's right. You can have 50 knots on this plane right now and all your control surfaces will respond normally because you've reduced alpha by unloading. The next thing then says, roll. Well, since you've unloaded, what are you going to roll with? Well, you're going to roll with ailerons and spoilers, aren't you? Rudder won't roll this plane at low angle of attack. Aileron and spoilers roll it. So we come in with aileron and spoilers, and we roll toward the nearest horizon. I, if you're right wing low, roll right. Now, some of you out there might say, well, I'm going to use a little coordinated rudder to help the nose come down. Fine. That's fine. That's good technique. A little, okay, smoothly applied. I mean, understand right here, if you jam full right rudder, that's the spin entry procedure. Thank you. <laughs> so, so what we want is we're going to use roll controls here and then a little coordinated rudder, fine. Okay. All right, what have we just done? By taking that act, what we have done, by, by making that action, we have rolled the lift vector off. When you roll the lift vector off, your nose is coming down, period. No matter what's wrong with this plane, your nose is coming down. Guys and gals, there are four hull losses out there in five years where both crew members are pushing full forward and it was never going to solve the problem. Never, due to the control anomaly that existed at the time. You've got to roll the lift vector off in those situations to get the nose coming down. The second problem, or the second issue here is if you try to go straight ahead over the top, a, you may not have enough energy to make it because it is the long way. It's the long way over the top. The short way is to roll out of it. That's the short way out. It will preserve the most energy. If you don't have enough energy, if you just try to go straight forward over the top, if you don't have enough energy to make it, you will stall and fall. If you have enough energy to make it over the top, everyone in the back will be... Yeah. Yeah, they'll be getting one of those zero to negative G rides. So, roll. It's the shortest way out of the problem and it will work no matter what's wrong. And this is a time critical event. We don't have a lot of time for analyzing what's wrong. We've got to keep this airplane under control. <clears throat> we got this next bullet that says normally limit bank angle to approximately 70 degrees. I hate a number. Whenever I put a number up, a pilot sees a target. So listen, that's not a target. It's kind of a limit. What am I saying there? Well, as I started doing this in, the, in, the, in our larger transport airplanes, I initially reverted to my other life. In my other life, you know, I just rolled to 90 degrees of bank and just came on down. Well, when I did that in the big transport simulators, I learned something kind of surprising. It shouldn't have been, but it was. As you come through the horizon to 90 degrees of bank on these big puppies, you don't have adequate roll rate to get the lift vector pointed back up before you end up with the nose way down here. Now you have to do one of them nose low recoveries. See? <laughs> uh, you know, you can, the good news is you can get them both done on the same maneuver. See? <laughs> but it's not ideal. All right? We really want, don't want that to happen. So the reason that 70 degree bullet's in there is say, you know, in these big guys, we've got to keep our lift vector up a little bit. So we approach the horizon. So we don't have so far to go with it to get it turned up the rest of the way because of our roll rates. The other way of looking at that, I want to kind of get this clear, is you don't need to go to 70 degrees of bank. That's not what I'm saying. If you're at 45 degrees climb, then maybe you only need 45 degrees of bank, and that'll be enough, you see? But don't, don't go through the horizon like this and these guys, it doesn't work. Thrust. Notice now comes thrust. What we're saying is roll first, then thrust. Do you see why? If you first roll the lift vector off and then thrust, thrust is good because it preserves energy. And on most nose high recoveries, you want to preserve all the energy you can. But if you roll and then thrust, that will not be counterproductive to getting the nose down. See why? Bullet number four has a whole bunch of nuances in it. It says as the aircraft symbol approaches the horizon. Well, that's the issue we just talked about. You've got to lead roll. You've got to lead the roll out in order to get the lift vector up in time. Okay. Then it says make a coordinated roll. And I have that word coordinated underlined. And the reason that I do is because I want to get it straight between us today what I mean by that. 
because rightfully there's a lot of different meanings for that word out there. Okay? But in everything we do today, when I say coordinated rudder, what I mean is that we will apply rudder in the direction we are trying to roll the plane. Left rudder, left roll. Right rudder, right roll. And just the amount of rudder that it takes to get the desired roll response. And these are very powerful rudders. It only takes smooth, small applications to get the desired result in most of our fleets. There is no time today we will use opposite rudder. None. Nothing we're going to do today involves opposite rudder. The only use I have for opposite rudder in these airplanes is, is, is uh, crosswind uh, landings and crosswind takeoffs. Okay? We will always be using coordinated rudder. It says make a coordinated roll to a wings level, slightly nose low attitude. You know what? This is the hardest thing of all for our airline pilots to do. It's fascinating to me to watch this. In other words, we want to recover wings level, slightly nose low. But you know what? As I watch all of our airline pilots, mostly Czech airmen, I'll see guys do this fantastic job and gals from the recovery process. They'll do a beautiful recovery. And they'll get the airplane just right here, and then they get here and they say, okay, that's it. I'm done. I'm an airline pilot. What I do now is I fly level. So they go straight to try and fly and level. They just haven't noticed one little thing. They're only going 80 knots. <laughs> So as they try to fly level at 1G, what goes out of limits? Angle of attack. Roar, and off we go from one of those nose low recoveries. See? So rather than have that happen to us, we want to recover wings level slightly nose low. I'm talking zero to five degrees, just slightly nose low every single time. If you do that, it is quite simple to fly this airplane at half a G. And if you're at half a G, it doesn't matter if you're going 80 knots. Does it? Not one bit. At 80 knots, at half a G, your alpha looks just like that. It's right in limits. Try to support 1G, whoo, out of limits. So in this nice, safe flight condition, we can look down then at our, and analyze our energy, our airspeed, and then adjust thrust and pitch as necessary and recover to level flight when we have the energy to do so. Are you okay on that? Stepping through that? Great. Let's move over now to uh, the nose low recovery procedure. Now, if you don't mind, before I start on these bullets, let me ask you to tell me, what is the first unseen, unwritten step? Autopilot and auto throttles off is always the first step. Okay. As we go through these bullets, starting with bullet number one, it says, roll the airplane in the shortest direction toward the sky pointer. That by itself will deal with many of these, just that bullet alone. In other words, let's take the airplane that looks like this. Okay, here he is. All right. And what that first bullet says is, we will roll the shortest direction toward the sky pointer. Well, as we roll toward the sky pointer, what's happening? We're putting the lift vector under the sky pointer, aren't we? And then we pull with the assurance we are pulling toward heaven. See? Simple enough. Simple enough. But now let's go to bullet number two. It says, with the bank angle in excess of 90 degrees, and this is where the airline accident history goes right down the tubes. With bank angle in excess of 90 degrees, we must maintain neutral to forward yoke pressure. Well, neutral to forward is a big range, isn't it? Well, what do we mean by that? Well, I think, I think you know. Suppose your airplane looks like this. Here you are. Okay? 90 degrees of bank, nose low. Look like this. Well, this is where the neutral part comes. Neutral. You're going to unload toward about zero G, quote, neutral. About zero G. And then, back to bullet one roll the shortest direction toward the sky pointer. What are we rolling with? We're rolling with yoke, with, with ailerons and spoilers, because we have no alpha on this plane. We roll toward the sky pointer, then we pull. Okay. Now, how about if our airplane looks like this? This is where the forward part comes. 
Very unnatural for an airline pilot to do this. But you are going to have to take the yoke of your airplane. If you're anywhere near pattern airspeeds or altitudes, you are going to have to take the yoke of your airplane and move it smoothly but aggressively forward. I didn't know that. I did not know that. When I first started doing these things in the simulator, I buffooned it. Because, see, in my other life, in my hand, in my stick, I had the entire stabilizer of an airplane. I had pitch authority. I could ease forward. I could ease forward on that stick, that airplane, and I could go to one negative G flight and fly along inverted. And if I had some extra energy, I could go farther forward on the stick and go outside. You know how that feels. See? But what I didn't realize and hadn't thought a lot about is the airline, the airline transport planes that we fly, all I have in my hand is a little bitty elevator on the back of a great big stabilizer that is still trimmed to whatever airspeed I entered this mess in. Guys and gals, you don't have the pitch authority to fly inverted at or near pattern speeds, period. Period. You know what I'm saying? You can't get to one negative G with all the elevator you've got. So get it in. Because if you get it in, what's going to happen? And I'm talking about low altitudes, you know, pattern kind of speeds, anywhere in the pattern range. You get it all the way in, what you're going to do is you're going to get past zero, probably, depending on where your stabilizer is trimmed to at the, this point. You're going to get past zero, but you're never going to get to negative one. What am I saying? With all of this in, your nose is still coming down. But it's coming down at a much slower rate, which is critical to success if the ground is here. Okay? All right. By the way, think about this. If you're holding this thing full forward in this scenario, and your seat belts are loose, instead of pushing forward, you're going to end up coming right up out of the seat and coming back on the yoke which is why I think most of us put on our harnesses and our crotch strap coming through 18,000 so that we're in there to stay. You're holding full forward on the yoke, and even though you're holding full forward on the yoke, your nose is coming down, but it's coming down at a much reduced rate. Now, since we're holding full forward on the yoke, we've actually got a negative alpha on this airplane right now, but that's what's going to roll the plane is going to be yoke, ailerons and spoilers. So as we hold full forward, we roll the yoke, and which way? Back to bullet one, we roll toward the sky pointer. So we're holding full forward and we're rolling toward the sky pointer. This is keeping our nose from dropping out. As we roll toward the sky pointer, notice that I get to this next one, which in yellow says apply coordinated rudder. Well, why am I saying put in coordinated rudder since I just said that rudder will not roll the plane at this alpha? But yet, I'm going to tell you to put your coordinated rudder fully in, fully, all of it, right now. Because as many of you know, the rudder in this portion of the roll becomes what aerobatic pilots call top rudder. It becomes the elevator of the airplane now. And these airplanes spend a lot of time in this portion of the roll. They don't roll that fast. So if you'll get your rudder fully in in the direction that you're rolling, it will keep the nose from dropping through because in this portion, there's nothing lifting. And if you don't put that rudder in, what's going to happen? When you get to this portion of the roll, she's going to slice out just like that. But if you got the rudder all the way in, it will hold the nose. Now, most fleet aircraft, the nose is, will still drop slightly even though the rudder is all the way in. depends on how fast you're going. Uh, but the rudder ratio kind of accommodates that, so at most speeds, you're still not going to be able to hold it. Okay? The MB-11, you MB-11 guys that are in here, you need to be aware you have the most powerful rudder on the planet. <laughs> it, 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 and you should know that. In your case, you actually don't need all the rudder. When I was doing this, I did this in all fleet aircraft, and the MB-11, I found I could actually stop the nose drop. Have you guys ever seen an MB-11 rudder? It's this great big segmented barn door. It comes off the tail and it goes all the way back to the nose. You seen anything? <laughs> it is unbelievable. So, for you MB-11 guys, use the rudder, but use it judiciously because it is very effective on that airplane. You guys can actually hold your nose in this portion of the roll. 
I mean, you can control it. It won't come down at all. The rest of us, even with all the rudder in, it's going to be coming down somewhat, but, but at a very slow rate. Okay, now we get through to bullet number four, which says, with bank angles less than 60 degrees. So what's happening here? We're holding the yoke full forward. We're rolling. Right now, we've got all the rudder in, too, don't we, in coordinated direction? We get in here, and when the bank angle comes to less than 60, what's coming up now? The lift vector, isn't it? So now we're going to go from pushing to pulling. And as we pull back, you won't believe what happens next because your left foot in this example is all the way deployed on the rudder. When you pull back, what goes up? Angle of attack. When angle of attack goes up, what rolls the plane? Rudder, exactly. And that rudder's all the way in. It'll whack. It'll try to snap roll. That's fine. Just neutralize the rudders real quick, okay? Because you want your lift vector up, don't you? And you want it up right now. But neutralize real quick or it'll go on by, okay? Okay, we got the lift vector up right now, and now we look like this, okay? Now we look like this. And then we come to the last step, which says, adjust thrust and utilize drag devices as required. As required for what? Yes, corner speed. For the first time, as we pull back, see the first four steps, what they're designed to do is minimize nose drop while we get the lift vector pointed up. That's what those first four steps do. And now I'm pulling out of this dive. And for the first time as I pull back toward either CL max or G limit, I look into my cockpit for what piece of information? Corner speed. And as I find myself below corner speed, as I pull, what will I do with my throttles? Max power. At or below corner, max power as I ride my stick shaker. If I find myself well above corner speed as I pull in my G limit, what do I do with the throttles? Idle. Those two actions will dramatically reduce the altitude lost and the resulting dive recovery. This yellow on the bottom says inverted, unload, and roll first, then pull. You will be hearing that from your simulator instructor repeatedly. You'll hear it in a briefing, you'll hear it in a sim, you'll hear it in a debriefing. The reason you're hearing it so much, guys and gals, is because the accident history on this is horrible. Airline pilots are doing this the other way around. Okay, what's that? Well, that's an MD-80 flat plate display. And uh, the reason it's in here is because I learned something. Uh, I learned a lot, actually. But this is another area where I learned something uh, that I hadn't thought much about before. I buffooned a couple of recoveries. Is, is I've done this for a lot of visiting firemen now in the simulator and all that sort of thing. And a couple, three times, I embarrassed myself uh, by not getting my SA correct uh, for a recovery. And, but what I learned from those is this. And this applies to any flat plate display. Okay, it doesn't matter which airplane you're in, A300s, MD-11s, this just happens to be an MD-80. This is our on it. As you look around, this is the case of the unit with its indices. That is the fixed aircraft symbol. That essentially is part of the case. It's the case. It never moves. It is always in exactly that position. It's the airplane. You are strapped to that. If you can think that way and realize that the screen floats behind you, you've got it. If conceptually you can think that way, you will never wrong, roll a long way. You will never push when you should be pulling. With that concept in mind, what I'm going to do is flip up the next screen. I'm going to ask you to announce out loud after you ascertain your SA, should you be pushing or should you be pulling? And should you roll left or should you roll right to put your lift vector under the sky pointer? Ready? Go. Yes, exactly. Push and right. Because I think you will agree that if you clearly realize that this is the airplane, then is there any doubt that I need to push and that the shortest direction to get the lift vector under the sky pointer is to roll right? If you think like that, I promise in a simulator you'll never go the long way around 
and more importantly in the real world. To complete this unusual recovery procedure segment of the Advanced Aircraft Maneuvering Program, I'd like to briefly review the proper use of rudder at high angles of attack. As I state in the aerodynamics segment, smooth application of small amounts of rudder coordinated with the aileron will significantly improve the roll response at high angles of attack. I'd like to re-emphasize that we have very large, powerful rudders on our aircraft. We do not want to introduce high side slip angles at high angles of attack by either kicking the rudder or applying the rudder in excess at high alpha. It only requires a small amount of smoothly applied coordinated rudder to achieve the desired result. This coordinated rudder will significantly improve the roll response at high angles of attack. Additionally, there is a lead-lag relationship associated with using the rudders at high angles of attack. That is, you must wait a second or two to see and feel the results of the rudder application. A lack of understanding of this effect can lead to over-controlling the aircraft. The high angle of attack maneuvering demonstration that you will be doing in your fleet simulators will familiarize you with this effect. The pilot not flying should refrain from applying any pressures on the controls, pitch, roll, or rudder. I know all of our highly experienced pilots realize the added pressures on the controls can make it very difficult for the pilot flying to feel and fly the airplane properly. Clearly, two pilots on the controls could result in over-controlling. If the captain wants to take control of the airplane from the first officer, he should call out. I have the airplane. And the first officer should state, you have the airplane. This procedure will clearly define the transfer of control. In conclusion, let me reinforce that AAMP emphasizes keeping the aircraft inside its flight envelope at all times regardless of attitude. Likewise, in your simulator training, you should never increase angle of attack above the onset of stick shaker alpha, that angle of attack that we know as CL max. I hope you'll find this video a useful review and that your simulator training will be both challenging and productive.